Thanks, everyone. Welcome to the 237th session of the online optom learning series OLS. And we are delighted to have with us uh, back again, uh, Dr. Shirley Lowe. Dr. Shirley uh, is doing the third session for us in the series of explaining about maintaining lifelong learning in terms of vision and applying the holistic eye care approach. Uh, a bit of background of Dr. Shirley. Dr. Shirley is a clinical optometrist who holds the undergraduate as well as postgraduate qualification from the University of Melbourne. Uh, she has over two decades of diverse experience in retail practices, in public health oriented practices, NGOs, corporate optometry, and she has uh, provided a lot of vision care going into mission trips uh, to the underprivileged and the indigenous population. She's a well-known speaker within the Asia Pacific as well as the international platforms when it comes to conferences, uh, particularly based on evidence-based practices and contact lens uh, technology. Currently, she is the professional education lead for Johnson & Johnson Vision for the Southeast Asia, India, Taiwan, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. She also has served on uh, the optometry associations for the Australian Optometric Association and also the Singapore Optometric Association Council. So with all that experience, welcome back uh, to our platform, Dr. Shirley. And, you know, let me just uh, leave the screen time to you, please. Fantastic. Thanks, Farouk. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me in this hour once again. And also thank you to OLS for this opportunity to share about lifelong vision with holistic eye care. It's um, something, as I've mentioned, I'm very passionate about, and this is the third part of that installment. So have some interesting facts and, and learning for all of us today. And I would just like to start off with a recap of what we have. And if you haven't participated in the previous webinars, uh, perhaps you can have a chance to look at the recordings of those as well, because we covered the whole concept of holistic eye care, which looks simple, but is a lot deeper, obviously, once you go into the details. And we shared about this very simplistic concept of looking good, seeing good and feeling good, which is, of course, the basis of our eye care as experts. And we started to broach upon the fact that beyond just looking good, seeing good and feeling good, we should be aiming to look our best, see our best and feel our best when it comes to our eye health, that we shouldn't compromise at all. We should really take the plunge and learn what we can to optimize ourselves. So with that, I would just like to focus on the one thing today, which is looking our best. And as I'm researching this topic, actually, I find that it can be broken down into three main areas, which is ocular, extraocular, and behavioral. So when we look our best, it is a combination of these three things that comes together and makes it come to life. So obviously, ocular is within the eyeball, the ocular domain extraocular, the tissues around it, etc., the muscles, the skin, the fascia, the orbital septum, and behavioral. Well, that's a very interesting topic. And uh, I guess it's the way our eyes behave, the functionality, which has a certain aspect of looking our best as well. And I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, see our eyes from a different perspective when we cover that this evening. So let me wish ahead. Of course, when it comes to ocular physiology and appearance, you know, it's really good to really deep dive again and think about all of the structures, you know, internally, externally that make up that whole domain of the eye and functioning as best as it can. And we have to recall that beyond the actual orbit, we have, you know, the surrounding glands, the surrounding tissues, and these things have to work in unison. It's like a symphony that has to be created and functioning at its best and optimal. Um, so starting off with the looking good ocular factors. So we'll, as I mentioned, we'll break up this talk into those three components. So when we're thinking about the eyeball itself, I think it's really important. Obviously, looking good is part of having a very good ocular surface and maintaining that in order to, to have the functionality of the eyes. Once we know that the tears are not functioning as well as they should, we do get the 
outward effects of then, you know, the irritated eyes, which then leads to redness. And as we mentioned in the previous webinars, the look good, see good, feel good triangle is actually all related, right? They're all among each other. And I would say that looking good is definitely not last place just because it's it's an appearance type of thing, right? It's not just cosmetics. It actually does blend into the function of the eyes. And, of course, when reviewing the uh, tear film itself, um, fortunately we do have a lot of great technology these days where we can um, look at the tear film in more exciting and different ways than we ever have before. But... Um, Unfortunately, dry eye is just becoming so prevalent among, you know, Asian populations especially. So for some reason, Asian eyes do have a, a lower tear breakup time than Caucasian eyes. And one aspect I'm going to focus on today is the meibomian glands, um, just because it is something that we're seeing issues with that we know that is a problem among certain populations. And once that meibomian gland dysfunction starts to occur, it can be a bit of a one-way street. Um, people get uh, drop out of meibomian glands and it then causes a cascade of issues. Of course, without that lipid layer, which is what the meibom is responsible for, it's going to help reduce that evaporation. So if we don't have that, we'll have excess evaporation and the dry eye cycle begins. So as a, as a recap from last talk, there is a dry eye cycle it's actually self-compounding. So the drier our eyes get, the more dropout we get of, of things like the goblet cells um, that produce the mucin, and then this causes further irritation, causes more osmolarity, it causes more inflammation. So it's like a, it's a positive cycle that makes it worse and worse. So I'm going to touch on some factors here that some people think are actually making them look good but actually have the uh, opposite effect. So let me share what that means. Okay. So, um, yeah, just as a recap as well, we also have to be very aware of the drainage system, everything that comes around it, the, the other lacrimal gl glands that are important for our tear film. All of this is very, very important for the, the function to work. So this is an example of, you know, um, some of the treatments that people are going for that supposedly are, you know, uh, helping their appearance in the short term. Um, I'm going to actually share with you here, it's a cosmetic treatment that is done permanently and it's actually uh, a colour, eye colour changing procedure that is done intracorneally so it's actually not in front of um, the cornea like a, like a uh, cosmetic contact lens. It's within the layers of the cornea and they actually do inject um, dye into those areas using lasers. And this is actually from New York and it's happening now. You know, you can pay a few thousand dollars to get this permanent change of eye colour. Let me just share with this video with you. And so she starts with brown. Mixing the pigment with the laser insertion. She's got blue eyes. Okay. Now, she does look good here. Will she look good in five years and ten years? What will that do, you know, to, to the structure of the cornea? Will it affect, you know, things like, you know, the surface of the eye, the goblet cells? Actually, this is just too new. I think there isn't enough perhaps research to know what the long-term effects are. Um, we do know some other cosmetic uh, issues that can um, take place as well. Um, things like recurrent corneal erosions, um, you know, they are very, and they're actually more common than we think. So according to this study, um, you can see here that uh, recurrent corneal erosions are actually um, present with sharp unilateral pain. So it's something that's very uncomfortable for the patients. Of course, you know, it doesn't look very good either. But in fact, um, they do happen at about an incidence rate of 1% uh, of the population, and they could possibly be underdiagnosed as well. So this um, does get exacerbated by a poor tear film and poor corneal integrity. Um, something else I wanted to, to share with you here as I mentioned, there's more and more technology these days to 
look at all different aspects of potential causes and uh, the condition of dry eyes. And one of those is these, uh, these instruments to actually visualize meibomian gland dropout. Now, when we're looking at the eyelids, when we, when we flip them, either the lower or upper eyelids, uh, it's actually very hard for us to visualize the meibomian glands very clearly. So this actually uses infrared light to be able to visualize them. And as you can see in the top here, in the top uh, uh, upper region, we can actually see you know, full meibomian glands. You can see that there isn't any sign of dropout. Now, when we have um, some changes in the structure, some dilation of the ducts, truncation, so when they're actually sort of cut short, they're not fully expressing what they should be expressing, we do get this um, slight dropout. Now, this is advanced where we have a lot of dropout already. Now, the patient won't be able to see this. And again, for practitioners, it is actually difficult for us to see this kind of view without this instrumentation. Um, now, interestingly, this um, meibomian gland dropout can actually occur when we abuse contact lens wear. So when people are actually over wearing their contact lenses, they can cause mechanical disruption to the meibomian glands. Um, but it can happen with age as well. So it's just something to be aware of. And, and again, people may be thinking there, you know, there's no consequences, I guess, for over wearing their lenses or perhaps wearing lenses that are not suitable for their eyes, such as, uh, you know, annual or three-month lenses, perhaps not taking good care of them as well. We do see a lot more of these issues with these patients. I think uh, the more that we have access to these devices now, we can actually take these photos and show patients so they have something to believe. Um, it's also a great baseline for people to, to show what the current state of your eye health is. On the flip side, it can be actually used to show the maintenance of eye health. So I believe that, you know, healthy contact lens wear done in the right way can actually main, help to maintain the meibomian glands. And I do think in the future, as these instruments become more common practice, it could actually serve as a baseline to show what you are like before contact lens wear. And then as the years go by, you know, there can be further tests, just like we do get our annual uh, health checkups, or at least we should be getting our annual health checkups. Now, another thing that people do, thinking that they are actually, you know, trying to improve the uh, cosmetics, so how they look, actually, again, can backfire on them. Um, so here is a case study, actually. Um, you can see here the, the top left is actually just someone who wears makeup very regularly so much of it that it's sort of seeped into um, you can see there the conjunctiva on the upper eyelid um, on the right is a uh, example another case study um, so you i'm not sure if you have ever seen adverts for uh, tattooing so permanent eyeliner done um, at this at the edge of the eyelashes um, it's actually in this case gone into the tissues of those very delicate structures and meibomian glands. And you can actually see that we have severe meibomian gland plugging in the right and left eyes after the tattooing was done. And so a lot of women actually do certain treatments, you know, thinking they're going to, to look better afterwards and it's actually causing more detrimental harm. So People perhaps are not aware of these things, and I think you know there's a in the in the realm of beauty treatments, there's a whole host of different uh, I would say expertise when it comes to this. So some people are quite unscrupulous, and they they're um, you know doing things perhaps that they're not very familiar with, or using technologies or techniques that they're not very expert with, and we we can get uh, you know these side effects that I'm sure the clients may not have known of beforehand. So. The reason why I'm talking about this, I think it's it's a good thing for us as practitioners to to be aware of these things. If we see patients with these sort of tattoos and uh, treatments done, we're aware of what's happened. If patients also ask us questions, is it safe? You know, I think it's it's worthwhile to be able to know the certain risks that people are taking. Now, um, this was done. This photo here you can see was two months after the surgery, uh, sorry, the tattooing, and you can still see that the, the pluggings happened on the day itself. So when it was actually um, 
carried out, this actually shows the epithelial defect in the in inferior right corner and left eye um, on the day of the tattooing. So with the various um, you know, chemicals and dyes and things used that seeped into the eyes, it's actually caused some uh, superficial defects in the epithelium that is coming up with it, with staining there. And so, you know, um, you know, I myself have had some like eyelash extensions done and not by a very well-trained technician. Um, and unfortunately, you're a bit helpless when you're doing these treatments sometimes. And, you know, by the time they get started, you're already lying down and taped, you know, they tape your eyelashes up and, you know, they start using chemicals and glue and things like that. And, you know, I've had experience where it was, you know, very painful. Um, but they were just telling you, oh, it's normal, you know, this is what it feels like. So it's it's quite a um, it, it's quite a, a risk, I guess, that people may be taking and not be fully aware because they think it's just some sort of very normal um, beauty treatment um, in the sake of looking good. So I'm going to share um, what I think is a non-invasive eyelash technique that I have um discovered myself so the important thing is if I just go a step back is the most important thing I guess is to avoid you know any makeup or cosmetics on the edge of the meibomian gland orifices you know you don't want to be blocking them up with any makeup or material or glue or any kind of um, chemicals at that point because that can disrupt the very delicate meibomian glands. So the, the idea is if you do want some cosmetic enhancements to only stay within the area of the eyelash itself and away from this rim here. So let me just share with you all my technique for doing so. Oh, yes, this, by the way, is an example of... Um, <laughs> quite excessive makeup, but it's not uncommon, you know, and there's a lot of, um, I would say, influencers who are teaching young women and women how to put makeup on using techniques where they, they do use a lot of coal and eyeliners and putting it right near what they call the waterline. That's the uh, the layman term, I guess, for the edges of the meibomian glands there. So uh, in my technique, I'm just going to share over a couple of minutes that this is what I just did yesterday, actually. So you can see here, we start off with, now men probably have never seen this before, but you can actually see, um, you know, using uh, eyelash curlers and using the right technique with, you know, the makeup, we don't get any on the actual meibomian gland itself. Very important to sweep upwards and away from the meibomian glands. I'm using sort of individual clumps here of these clusters of eyelashes. Now, this is a temporary way of doing it. I'm, I'm applying glue very, very carefully not to go beyond the lash line and individually placing these extensions on. Now, this is a way to actually be able to, you know, have that very fashionable look that women are actually going for. And I think especially if they're wearing contact lenses as well because a lot of women actually contact lenses and um, eyelash extensions at the same time. If you're blocking the meibomian glands, you, you're going to dry the eye out and you're not going to have a good contact lens wearing experience. And, and you can see here, sort of uh, cluster by cluster, I'm just going across and making sure that I never go beyond that line. It's always actually on the edge of the uh, where the eyelashes emerge and nothing below that. So again, this is the glue that goes on the eyelash uh, line there and you can see I'm very very careful to place it above by by pulling upwards and you can see I can pull the eyelash it does there are sort of um, you know eyelash removing liquids that you can use to take away the um, adhesive so of course you know accidentally getting this in your eye is actually quite uncomfortable as well but it's um but if, you know, you can do it yourself or you have someone to be able to do it in a very careful way, you're going to be able to get the, the look that women are looking for without having dry eyes. So, you know, this is something I have been recommending to more and more people. Of course, it takes a certain amount of, I would say, um, practice to get it right, but it's actually um, better in the long term. So it's um, not as uh, destructive. So the other 
main ways that you'll see it's it's almost more common than not than in some populations of women now that they do have these extensions in it's actually a more sort of permanent sort of semi-permanent i would say where they bond the the individual eyelashes to your individual eyelashes and this actually causes potentially some disruption to the the eyelash follicle itself so it can um it can be sort of heavy on each lash and um they're usually not removed as often as they should be. So um, it was only after some time that I realized that these sort of semi-permanent eyelashes should actually be, um, I would say, removed and replaced, you know, more often than, than most people have time for. So you're supposed to go back in. And the reason for that is as your eyelash naturally grows outwards, if the eyelash, the artificial lash was glued close to the root, it would start to shift away from the root as the hair, as the eyelash grows further out, which means that the weight of the artificial lash is actually pulling on the follicle and it can actually cause like longer term damage to the eyelashes. So you you end up uh, with less eyelashes or poorer quality eyelashes than you did to begin with. It can actually damage them. So this is a way to to not damage it. You can remove it, you know, every day, or it can last about a, you know a couple of days before um, you know they naturally come off. Or you do use a solvent, which is very gentle. Okay, so these are advice we can give out as um, le- young ladies and um, especially those who wear wearing contact lenses. Okay, um, so I'm going back to this uh, uh, recurrent corneal erosions. And um, as I mentioned, these can occur, um, you know, just with a bit of um, incidental damage. So doing these beauty routines, potentially there is a risk for accidentally, you know, scraping or um, you know, harming your eye surface. So Again, being extra careful to do it is, is super important and, and having the practice and um, and actually, you know, the good mirror, good lighting while we do all these things is very important. But if we, we accidentally do, you know, scrape a mascara wand or something along the eye surface, you know, we can get the, the effects of uh, recurrent corneal erosions. And as, as we know, it's actually, um, you know, it's it's when there is damage to the surface um, at the epithelial level where it, you know it never has time to fully recover and it actually uh, takes off the surface layer, especially you know after sleeping overnight and our eyelid itself will dislodge the cornea in a very the corneal epithelium sorry in a very disruptive and painful way. So this is not what we want in terms of um, our patients. So, um, so in this study, it was actually found in a UK hospital that uh, the prevalence um, is actually 0.96%, so about 1% here. That shows that it's not an uncommon thing, but identifying it can be challenging. And minor cases heal, and this is the problem. They often sort of heal overnight or heal during the day. So by the time the you know, they get checked out, it might not be there, but there is highly likely that there's um, a lot of these recurrent corneal erosions happening um, that are underdiagnosed and underreported. So this is something that we should be aware of as eye care practitioners, um, which could explain why some patients actually do feel more comfortable with contact lenses sometimes because it acts as a bandage contact lens. Um, so I wanted to point out here as well on this whole uh, concept of looking good when people are trying to look good with ocular lenses such as beauty lenses. Um, sometimes as well they're doing themselves um, a disservice by using lenses that are actually not healthy for the eyes. And you can see here these are images of some cosmetic lenses which have been shown to have pigment on the surface. And these were just taken with a digital microscope that can be, you know, bought, you know, online these days. Um, they can be observed and you can actually see the, the raised pigment on these surfaces. So you can imagine every time the lid runs over these edges of these ridge, um, it's going to be disruptive to the tissues of the conjunctiva 
and it's going to be very uh, painful after a while, causing irritation. And I've actually got another example here. Um, and something else to, to consider is not just in terms of the health, but again, we're still talking about what uh, the eyes look like. And this is a comparison of an eye-inspired design, which is more like the natural iris as compared to this dot matrix style. So you can actually see, again, um, using a magnifier. So this one's an optical magnifier to see how the, the lines drawn are actually hand-drawn designs. And when we use a different lens, which is um, one with the dot style, which is printed on the surface of the lens, you can see the, the big difference here in what it looks like. So in terms of cosmesis as well, that's something that we can also consider. Um, here we have an article about using atomic force microscopy and a scanning electron microscopes to look at different roughness of the surfaces of different lenses. And um, again, you can see here that there's a lot of variation. Um, what they've done in this particular study is looking at lenses which have pigments. So doing sampling either on the front surface or the back surface, which is what this means, in the pigmented part and the non-pigmented part. So as you know, with cosmetic enhancement lenses, there's a ring of pigment on the lens. And so they do a sample um, on the clear section as well as the non-clear section, both on the front and back of the lens. And in this study, you can actually see that some lenses have um, more roughness, for example, on the pigmented back surface. So you can see here, for example, this one, this one, um, this one has more pigment on the pigmented back surface. But interestingly, there's roughness on the front surface as well. So is the pigment on the front or the back of these lenses? Most probably it is on the back, but the way that it's been printed onto the lens sort of pushes with enough force to cause a bit of a stamping effect and that you get a bit of roughness on both edges as well. So, so that one will actually face both the conjunctiva and the cornea that you'll get the roughness. Now, there are some lenses, as you can see, they basically only have roughness on the pigmented front surface, which would be these two examples here. And there are some lenses which have very um, consistent smoothness, whether it's on the front surface, the back surface, or on the pigmented or non-pigmented areas, which indicates that the pigment is not disrupting the surface quality of that lens. And, and this is what we should be looking for in cosmetic enhancement lenses. Okay. And um, in this particular study here, we showed that there was um, only one brand here, which definitely showed a clear pigment layer encapsulating the pigments in what was done um, in determining where the uh, pigments were located. So these are factors that we could actually consider when recommending these lenses to look good. And, uh, and about a third to a half of new wearers are actually going to cosmetic lenses as their first choice these days to get into the category. So as practitioners, we should be uh, you know, allowing them to choose what they want to wear. Now, in this particular study, they actually did look at um, the cross layer at 0.4 micrometers and 2.4 micrometers. So very, very small amount to see, you know, is there pigment at this depth of the lens? And, um, or sorry, is there a clear layer at this point in the lens? And definitely there's no issues right there. So moving on. Because that study showed that there was uh, in other contact lenses that don't have that clear layer at the 2.4 micron level, um, the, tear, the tear film will not be thick enough to cushion the impact of that surface pigment. So just as a reminder here, there's a diagram. You can see that, for example, if there was definitely pigment um, disruptions at the level of 2.4 microns, the, um, the pre-corneal, uh, the pre-lens tear film is actually sometimes as thin as two microns thick, which means it won't be 
uh, thick enough to cushion the impact of those bumps and ridges that are caused by those pigments. So just to try and illustrate here, you know, if the lens is moving on the eye surface, it's going to, you know, actually go beyond the tear film itself and disrupt the, the tissues. In this case, it would be the cornea, other conjunctival tissues. Um, another thing to point out is in these cosmetic lenses that what's the effect of them beyond just uh, the, the roughness, there's actually a greater chance of them to pick up um, bacterium. So you can imagine if there's going to be rough surfaces on a cosmetic lens, there's going to be nice housing for potential bugs to, to stick onto. So uh, in this particular study done by uh, Professor Pauline Cho in Hong Kong, she actually did two parts of the study. So one was to, to check if the lenses had pigment on the surface by first doing a rub-off test. Now, um, uh, only a couple of the lenses did not rub off easily. And um, so this particular uh, test is a little bit hard to recreate outside the laboratory because it depends on how hard you rub and, you know, what solution you're using and things like that. So I would suggest, you know, it can be a bit misleading if you're doing it yourself. If you if you rub a lens and you don't see pigment come off, we can't assume that there's no surface pigment. Um, but in her study, they tried to standardise it as much as possible. And the second part of the test was to then look at the lenses which had uh, what she determined as surface pigment because it rubbed off and those that did not to see how much bacteria would adhere. So they actually took a number of sample lenses and inoculated them um, with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which, as you all know, is one of the more common um, uh, bacteria that causes some of the severe corneal disruptions. And you can actually see, you know, a significant amount more um, adhesion. You can see this is colony form forming units per lens. And there were five lenses per different brand here. And you can see, actually, we can have, you know, up to 10, even you know, about 30 times more colony forming units than those that did not have um, the surface pigment. So it's, it's a lot easier for these pigment to these uh, bacteria to stick to the pigmented surface lenses. And um, yes, I think this is something to be aware of because each colony forming unit, uh, what that means is it's a single bacterium that took hold, that took place on the lens and started to replicate and form a little colony. So uh, on, on an individual lens, they actually counted these. And this would be equivalent to, you know, a, an infection starting up on the eyes as well. So, you know, this is something that we, we should think about when it comes to prescribing beauty contact lenses, also the design of the lenses for something to be more na like nature. You can actually see in the Caucasian eye, we actually have a lot of texture and changes, and this is thought to be more interesting, um, perhaps more interesting visually than the, the flatter sort of less detailed um, brown iris of most Asian eyes. So it's something that we can add a bit more interest is something that we can look for as well. Now, the reason why looking good with beauty lenses actually works is the contrast that it creates. And part of that is because it's linked to our feeling of youth. So when we're younger, there is greater contrast between the iris color and the sclera. And as we get older, unfortunately, you know, our sclera tends to be sort of less pristine white as it once did. And so we get less contrast. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it is um, impacting and improving the visual appearance of the eyes. You can see it's quite a universal concept to have greater contrast. You can see these are the same lips with more contrast and that's considered more beautiful. But beyond that, interestingly, um, having a darker limbal ring, which increases the contrast, also influences facial attractiveness. So there was one study where there were uh, a number of uh, different faces that were shown to a group of 40 observers, both male and female. And the pictures were altered such that they were using Adobe to 
to make a limbal ring more um, obvious or less obvious, and they didn't change anything else about the face. And um, there was a significant difference in those um, faces which had a more clear limbal ring were considered more attractive. So that's interesting. And it could be part of our evolution in that um, when we're looking at eyes, um, it's sort of subconscious, but having a clear limbal ring sort of first of all shows youth, but it also shows, you know, health. So overall um, health and vitality. So perhaps that is something that, um, yeah, as humans, we subconsciously think about each other and we don't have to, you know, try to do that. It's just built into us. Okay. Um, so another thing to start pointing out here is, you know, uh, UV protection is really important. So we do know that there are UV effects on the skin that can affect the appearance of the skin. Um, this is actually my kid who's seven years old, and you can actually see here that he's got, uh, you know, very pristine skin. And this is my eye up close. And um, I myself have been trying to be very UV conscious all my life, but, you know, that is something that you know, still does affect me. And you can see the effect of the UV radiation. Um, and you might think, you know, is it just UV or is it other factors? You know, could it just be general aging? So I've got here a little video that I'll play where you can see how the UV has affected the, um, the open part of my eyes. But you can see where there is no sunlight that reaches this part of the eye. You can see that still remains quite pristine and white. So it's just quite a clear demarcation. I think you can see in that video just across here where it's covered by the eyelid normally is, is where the uh, effects of UV have, have already affected my eyes. So that's, again, um, a cosmetic of concern more than anything else, uh, but it's something that uh, perhaps women would be more aware of if we educate them. And um, so moving on, um, so beauty is actually becoming more important to overall sense of wellness and uh, what has become more evident post-COVID is that health and well-being are more important than ever. So people are becoming more health conscious, more self-conscious. And uh, when it comes to potential beauty contact lens wearers, they actually, their biggest concern is to avoid long-term damage. Um, so this is interesting that they they want their eyes to stay healthy as well as beautiful. So knowing what they need is is actually and what their desires are is something that should um, play a role when it comes to selecting the right lens for our patients. Okay, now I'm going to go into the next part, which is looking good for extraocular factors, um, so outside of the eyes. Um, I'm going to talk about blepharospasm, eye twitches. So, you you know, you won't look good if your eyes are twitching, and um, it, it is, of course, um, not feeling very good either, but in terms of looking good, it's it shows the signs of you know eye fatigue. So I, this is actually myself, you know, um, a couple of months ago in a very particular busy time. So you can actually see if you look closely, there is an eye twitch. So you can see, see, you see here this little pulsating, a little twitching. Now it's very very subtle, and it looks kind of like it's vibrating almost. Um, which doesn't um, sort of uh, look too obvious, but it it doesn't feel great either. So let me just show that again. Looking at, can you see here? It's like a, it's almost like a little heartbeat within the eye. And of course, this is not voluntary at all, and um, you know can be quite disconcerting when it starts. So um, you know things that, that can cause that. So at the time I would have to say this was the issue, not getting enough sleep. Um, it wasn't excessive alcohol and caffeine because I don't really have much of those at all. Um, so eye fatigue and binocular vision problems can contribute to eye twitches um, or blepharospasm. Imbalance of electrolytes, vitamin B12, vitamin D or magnesium can also cause that. Dry, irritated eyes and drug interactions can all result in eye twitches. Um, 
And so these are things we can counsel patients about. Another thing I recommend is um, just having, you know, uh, a cooling eye patch. So these are, for example, gel eye pads you can place in the freezer and keep them there. So you can actually place them over your eyes and suggest that, you know, patients do the same thing as well. And that actually helps reduce the um the irritation and can calm down, you know, an eye twitch if it's starting. Um, but of course, the root cause is more important to address as well. You know, is is the patient getting enough sleep? Are they overdoing the caffeine? You know, and things like that. So just something to be aware of. Okay. And um, okay, now I'm going to continue talking about eyelids. And um, it was interesting in my research, I actually found that the first uh, eyelid surgeries were recorded in the 10th century. So early Islamic hospitals were actually doing these eye surgeries for ptosis. Um, you can see here back in the 10th century. So these particular Arabian surgeons described the significance of excess skin folds in impairing eyesight, um, and they excised the skin to improve vision. Um, now they didn't have anesthesia back then, so <laughs> I guess it was um, it was uh, you know done only when it was when it had to be done, really when people were having their vision effective. Um, and this was the first example of surgical approach through the management of dermatochelasis, um, which is uh, another form of you know droopy eyelids. So the causes and complaints. Um, now again, uh, I'm going to go through different aspects of, you know, this treatment as well today. We see a lot of these, you know, before and after, um, you know, surgery, which is, you know, great for patients like this one, for example, who you can see, you know, would, would have significant cosmetic concern for this level of dermatochelasis. And you can see here after the surgery, you know, his eyes are a lot more open. So, this usually results from the normal physiological senile changes occurring in the periocular tissues, so obviously ageing. First of all is the traction due to the contraction of the orbicularis muscle, which is the blinking. So basically, you know, blinking all your life um, sort of stretches the skin a bit and causes laxity along with gravity. Um, can lead to a loss of the quantity of elastic tissue in the skin and weakening of connective tissues, leading to relaxation of the structures, especially of the lateral part. So it actually generally starts laterally, you can see here on this patient. And um, now when it comes to what the patient experiences, it's not just the drooping itself, but, um, you know, this they feel actually makes them feel dull or look older than their age. So it's, you know, very aging, I guess. Um, other effects, for example, ocular irritation, secondary to chronic brephloritis, dry eye and misdirected lashes. So because, you know, the function of the eyelid, perhaps where they're situated is not where they should be. So they're actually, for example, you know, the, the glands may not be, you know, facing in the right direction. And for example, the myobermian glands may not be uh, pumping out the myobum into the right area of the eye or it's it's missing that so you're not getting as well-formed tear film in some cases you can get an epiblepharon and and you can actually see the lateral lashes causing scratching on the ocular surface and this is resulting in staining so you know these are all affecting the way it looks but also feels so as i mentioned um you often get the lateral lash ptosis and in fact you can get obstruction of peripheral temporal visual field or reduction in quality of vision eventually which you know some patients will want to to fix now i just wanted to point out um an interesting example here that it's not just the elderly that can get this occurring. It's actually a younger patients as well. So uh, visual obstruction. This was actually in, you can see uh, a 36 year old, you can see here age 36, but there is significant um, reduction here in the amount of visual um, ability in the upper hemispheres. So by the way, this patient didn't necessarily look that obvious when it comes to the eyelid overlap you know the person 
look like a you know fairly typical 36 year old and so some people may think that it's purely a cosmetic kind of procedure and people are you know um, getting it just to look better but in fact um, it doesn't have to be that obvious a, a, a sort of ptosis for it to cause visual obstruction and the only way to really test that obviously is through a proper visual field test to determine if it is affecting the vision um, in this case it was and post-surgery you can see here um, now there is a clear visual pathway post-surgery and of course you can see a bit of um, you know uh, this is more like an artifact actually where the nasal structures are so um to be aware, though, that it's quite a complicated process in terms of the blepharoplasty procedure that people go for, so either to look good or to make sure they have good vision. Now, um, it starts off here by having a very good understanding of the eye anatomy, especially the eyelid. So interestingly, the eyelid skin is the thinnest in the body and has no subcutaneous fat layer, and it's very, very thin at under one millimetres. Um, the pre-tarsal tissues are firmly attached to the underlying tissues, so it is difficult to operate. Um, on the contrary, the preceptal tissues are loosely attached, which leads to the, the space for fluid accumulation. So that's why you hear that sort of puffy look as you get older as well on those upper eyelids. Now, the upper eyelid can be divided into the tarsal and orbital portions at the level of the subtarsal fold. So that tends to be about three to five millimetres above the, um, the lash line here when it comes to Caucasians. But in Asian eyes, it can be much less, resulting in what we call a single eyelid. Um, so again, some people think that is not as cosmetically pleasing, but in some cases it can be, you know, starting to become pathological. So um, it can be both. Now, following on um, from this, so the posterior and orbital septum and, and is anterior to the levator aponeuroses, and and they that's where they they have that uh, pre aponeurotic fat. So it's actually the fat that needs to be removed from this section, um, and it can be divided into yellow coloured central fat and a nasal fat pattern. So I'm just going to pre-warn everybody that I will show a picture of what the surgery is looking like. So if you needed to, to look away when I show that, <laughs> please do. But I think as, as practitioners, as eye care professionals, we should be aware of what these procedures actually look like because it is very important to distinguish the soft yellow orbital fat from, the, from a lacrimal gland and um, the gland actually looks very similar in shape. Now, of course, you don't want to remove the lacrimal gland itself, but the gland has a firm texture and is a pinkish gray color. So that's sort of how one can determine if it's different or not. So I'm going to share the picture now. And um, you can see this is what the surgery would consist of, right, in terms of removing the fat pad um, and not removing the lacrimal gland, which is very important. But as you may recall in our earlier slides, the lacrimal gland kind of looks similar to this, right? So, you know, very important not to, to mix those up. Um, so what about, um, you know, eye bags underneath the eyes, right? This is another cosmetic concern for people. Um, what causes eye bags? So sort of similar to the eye twitches or blepharospasm and not getting enough sleep again is a big culprit um, too much salt in the diet causing fluid retention congestion due to allergies uh, smoking and medical conditions such as renal disease and thyroid eye disease so you know eye bags definitely uh, are something that a lot of us are concerned about and it's the congestion of the fluids underneath the eyes due to these causes that results in the dark circles and eye bags that we see, which is obviously not looking good anymore. So some of the tips that we can suggest, um, getting seven to nine hours of sleep every night, which is sometimes easier said than done. Um, so just prioritizing the sleep, which can help reduce and clear out those um, fluids again. Uh, of course, turning off digital devices early, or um, using blue blocking, you know, lenses and things like that may also help. 
um, try raising the bed slightly for people who have quite severe swelling. Um, this might change the, the fluid collection from underneath the eyes, but this change of position is a little bit harder for some people to sleep. So, um, you know, depending on how bad the, the situation is. Um, as I mentioned, the cool compress can actually help with this as well. So one of these um, actually find it very, very useful um, and eating less salt can help with the fluid retention. So these are all sort of advice that we can give. Um, if people want to try these things before going for the eye surgery. So I think as clinicians, sometimes we do find ourselves in the position where we're advising patients whether they should go for such procedures or not. And I think it's really uh, a risk to benefit ratio that we have to consider. So obviously, if someone is having um, pathological reasons why they would want the surgery, such as, you know, having a block in vision um, or having these problems with the eyelashes, entropians, ectropians, etc., then, you know, you you're almost, you know, better off to try because you are already suffering. But when it comes to a purely cosmetic reason, I think people have to be fully aware that there can be uh, risks to that surgery as well. Um, and I think it's important for, you know, people who undergo surgery themselves to actually look at what the surgery will in consist of. You know, I think it's important for people to be fully aware of what will be happening to their tissues of the eyes. You know, um, I think some people want to avoid seeing that, but I think understanding the so-called worst case scenarios are very important for any kind of surgery. I think it's important for the for a person to take an educated decision to say, you know, these procedures are, for example, 95 to 98% successful. You know, that sounds pretty good. I think it's the question of, you know, if I'm in the 1%, if I'm in the 2% that have these bad um after effects, you know, would I be okay with that? You know, can I go to sleep at night knowing that I've taken this risk versus someone who says, oh, I didn't even know this was a risk when I had this procedure, you know, similar to what we shared before the the, the lady who had the eye tattoo, I'm sure she didn't know this was a potential risk for her to damage her myobiomian glands. Um, again, with eye surgery, it, it is permanent changes. So my suggestion when we counsel patients is to, you know, please, please take the time to read about the, the side effects and risks. Um, and if you can possibly stomach, but look at, you know, the, the outcomes that didn't turn out well and what surgery really looks like and, you know, to, to make that decision uh, for yourself. Um, so lower so lower blepharoplasty, which is the removal of eye bags, is it actually one of the most common cosmetic surgeries performed in the United States? Um, it can affect, you know, the tear um, quality again, um, and it can it's in itself cause entropians and ectropians. Too much can actually cause the retraction. So, um, so for example, in uh, this case here, we have the eyelid retraction after lower eyelid blepharoplasty. Um, so we actually have these bad effects after the surgery. Okay, now um, I'm going to go into looking good and behavioral factors. So um, what I'll share about now is, so we've gone through some of the, the factors that in terms of the ocular structures and the extraocular structures for them to look and stay looking good. Um, and now I'm going to look at how the eyes behave and what we, behavioral factors may influence their so-called attractiveness. And, um, you know, contact lenses are actually, you know, one of these things, again, that people may feel better when they wear them. So, for example, they have an opportunity to use non-prescription sunglasses they are better for sports and the more sports that people feel confident in doing can have other effects, you know, in terms of cardiovascular health and the aspects that we covered in last um, webinar where it was good, cardiovascular health was good for overall health and as well as our vascular health in our eyes, which can help with, you know, conditions like glaucoma and more um, natural vision, and having a better field of vision, patients generally feel they look better. I think your 
know someone who always sort of takes their lens, their glasses off when they take a photo or a selfie. You know, they're just like, oh, hang on, you know, take my glasses off. You know, some people feel better like that. And, of course, they're not affected by rain and do not fog up. And there's some, you know, these factors to, to consider in terms of our lifestyle as well. And, um, you know, at this juncture, I just like to ask a question because another effect of confidence is when we start to need multifocal lenses. So um, maybe I could just have some answers in the chat as well. I'll get your opinion. What's the most common uh, emotion that people feel when they're told they have presbyopia? So just like to get any feedback here. You want to share what you feel? Is it fear, sadness? I see someone writing denial. Yes, denial again. C, lack of confidence. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. E, denial as well. Yeah. No, thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Okay. So I've um, asked this for a number of different audiences and denial is the one that comes up the most often and from our so-called um um, case reports and um, consumer surveys, this is often it as well. So uh, definitely it is a time when we we should be letting our patients know of all of their options when it comes to vision correction. Some of them just don't know that there are solutions for them that can really suit their lifestyle. And sometimes we have to be a bit flexible when it comes to, you know, prescribing um certain vision correction for certain activities that they're doing um, that can suit most of their daily lifestyle. And what I wanted to share here was it is sometimes um, uh, an easy way out to give monovision to multifocal wearers instead of, you know, going through a multifocal contact lens because it's sort of an easier way and a low-cost way. But the thing is, there are some downsides to that. So um, there will be um, reduced stereopsis um, with the monovision and reduced binocular contrast sensitivity function with monovision. And there's also less longevity. So in terms of being able to keep um, having a greater disparity as the ad goes up, you know, you're going to have um, a greater disparity between the eyes and you'll sort of hit a plateau where you can't really help the patient anymore. It will start to become too dispersed. So having a multifocal contact lens is actually a longer term solution in that if someone wants to continue wearing their lenses, they can, um, you know, slowly work their way up from a low to mid to high ad, which most, you know, multifocals do come in, multifocal glasses. And again, it gives flexibility for our patients. You know, they can wear multifocal glasses sometimes, they can wear multivocal contact lenses for other activities that they want to feel better in and look better in. Um, so we do have to consider it may reduce the multifocal contact lens um, success rate and lead to drop out um, if we have um, just the, the monovision, eventually they will drop out. Um, it's important at this stage for them to set the right expectations. So um, describing how a multifocal contact lens could help with specific benefits, you know, things that they want to do. I have a friend who, for, for example, did wear monovision for some time and then he realised that he's, he loves to play tennis but he couldn't quite contact the ball. He was keep missing his shots because he lost that stereopsis, you know, and this is why currently we're trying him out on a multifocal. Um, and then, you know, just pointing out, you know, or asking our patients if there are other times where they don't want to wear their glasses or want to have greater flexibility in the activities that they're doing. So having the right conversation and realising that, you know, in terms of looking good, we can never quite look and feel exactly how we did when we were 20 years old. You know, our eyes have changed and accommodation is less, but we can use a number of different solutions that allow for the flexibility of, of that patient. And I would definitely encourage you all to, to keep you know, digging deeper and finding new and inventive ways. For example, multifocal contact lenses that they can wear most of the time. Perhaps they wear, um, you know, over-the-top readers or over-the-top distance glasses when they really need that very clear crystal vision. It just is an option for, to allow people to have a very flexible lifestyle. 
Um, I believe when I start to need presbyopic correction, that's probably something that I would do because, uh, like myself, there are a lot of people who who don't want to be, you know, wearing glasses full time. Um, and yep, so when we're selecting our multifocal contact lenses, do consider things like the physiology and optics, the lens material and design. So getting familiar with different designs as well as the fitting guide is, is very important. And I would really suggest that you familiarise yourself with individual fitting guides when fitting different brands of contact lenses because they all operate with very different technologies and designs um, and there is no one-size-fits-all. And going by, I would say, um, your own feeling, your own gut feeling when prescribing these does not result in the biggest success rate. If you want a bigger success rate, less chair time, greater returns and more satisfied patients, um, you really get um, considered using the fit guide and getting the correct um, feedback. So the last part of the behavioral is actually, I'm going to talk about eye contact. So eye contact is also a big part of looking good. It's about um, how much we can give to others. And as we know, we just get that sense of, you know, closeness building rapport with people who are giving us eye contact. I think the more, you know, confident we feel about ourselves, the more willing we are to do that. So let me just share this study, which actually asked that question in a scientific way because we kind of know it um, in a very um, subconscious way. But in this particular study, um, we, we see here that we pre they presented a number of faces, um, both attractive and, and unattractive um, and smiling or neutral, um, but in terms of using different directions of gaze. And there was a, a you know, bunch of participants to judge the so-called attractiveness of the faces. And it was actually found that attractive faces are appealing. Um, and in fact, it was similar amount to so having the right gaze of eye contact was similar to having an attractive face as well so the same amount of attractiveness um, was given to to this uh, factor of position of eye gaze which is interesting um, and there was another study here showing um, there was like a, a speed dating uh, experiment where again um, they actually tracked the eye movements of um, potential um, partners uh, as they did a speed dating exercise. And the question was, you know, if they were willing or wanting to go on a you know, second date with this person. So it's interesting to point out here. Um, it was a five-minute conversation that they had and their eye movements were tracked. Um, so it was found that there was um, that mutual eye contact is um, an important part of cho choosing a potential mate and subjects were more likely to choose those dating partners with whom they shared more eye contact with. So there's actually strong evidence points towards eye contact as a driving force behind signaling interest. And um, what do that actually mean in results? There was actually um, three times more attractive if there was more um, eye contact. So on average, subjects, like I mentioned, indicated if they would like to, to meet that potential partner a second time. So they did a regression analysis and found that with each additional minute of mutual eye contact, there was um, you know up to a threefold chances for that selection again. And in this case, it was, um, again, similar to perceived attractiveness. You can actually see here in this table below, um, you can see this is sort of the grades one, two, three, and four of perceived attractiveness. And the partner's eye duration was actually the highest here at 0.87. This is in terms of the correlation. So it's the highest correlation here. Um, interestingly, you're looking at someone else did not predict their mate choice. So if you're just staring at someone, it doesn't matter if you're looking at them. So perhaps people were looking at, you know, a feature or looking at the, sh you know, the, the shape of their face or features, but that didn't necessarily result in more, um, 
you know, attractiveness to that person. It's not much, It's not about how much you're looking at someone. It's how much you perceive them as looking at you. So how much mutual eye contact there is is the deciding factor. So, again, this could, um, you know, again, show a subconscious understanding of the person being very confident about themselves. And, of course, I feel like we can have, you know, greater eye contact and connection um, when we don't have a frame in the way, you know, and I think this is, um, again, a lot of people are known to feel more confident, you know, with contact lenses. And so, you know, this is potentially something we could consider. So um, in summary, I just wanted to share a few uh, points from this whole webinar series because we have covered a lot of ground in terms of um, all of these aspects. So um, I hope you have a better understanding and in-depth knowledge of what it, when we say look good see good feel good it is not just a catchphrase it really is there's a lot of level of detail and under each of these that we could be maximizing but the summary that i wanted to share with you is to try new things like cosmetic contact lenses or contact lenses you know clear ones um, also there are various cosmetics and treatments out there but do so in an educated and safe way and they can do wonders for your overall confidence and sense of well-being um, so you know as I mentioned myself I do um, try these new techniques and things and I think it helps me overall feel you know better for work situations better for social situations as well and um, you know feeling um, a sense of belonging because I think there are certain standards, beauty standards that are expected of women these days, but something to feel good about yourself. Um, another thing is our understanding of ocular physiology and function is constantly evolving. So continue to educate yourself and your patients. So, you know, things that we didn't think were sort of um, um, uh, affecting each other before, we're seeing the links, you know, across systemic systems, across ocular systems. So, getting that deeper understanding is happening all the time. And finally, you know, you can be the inspiration for your patients, live a healthy life yourself. I think we went through some of those in the previous webinar and have no regrets about your eye and overall health for life. So, you know, I hope, you know, touch wood, I do never get you know, glaucoma or, you know, I'm able to ward off AMD for as long as possible. But if, there is some chance I do get some of these um, degenerative diseases one day. I, I don't want to think to myself, what if I could have you know, done something? You know, what vitamins do I need to take now? You know, is it too late by then? I think prevention is always better than cure. I want to be at a stage where if I do unfortunately get the, any of these conditions in my life, I don't feel like, oh, I could have done something better or different. I am I'm at a position where I'm learning to maximize and optimize um, and doing that in a health safe educated and fun way as best as I can so I hope this uh, yeah again brings a new perspective to to taking care of your own eyes as well as your patient's eyes and to delve into areas that are typically not um, usual for an eye care professional to really um, get sink our teeth into those because if you don't then your patients will have to find their own answers themselves maybe by trial and error and, and not get the best results and maybe even getting uh, permanent uh, bad effects to their eyes so with that I just wanted to um, ask if there's any final questions as well from this series and uh, yeah looking forward to your your comments Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shelley, for you know doing this series for us. I mean, you did cover a lot of uh, important aspects, and I, I would say that most of it were something which we routinely see and we routinely need to talk about to uh, about this to our patients. So this is really engaging and uh, something which we can bring it and apply into practice tomorrow straight away. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Great. There was one question which uh, Dr. Shirley popped up when you started the conversation talking about uh, mebobian glands and looking at the mebobian glands as well. So somebody wanted to know if you have any experience in using these newer autorefractometers with infrared cameras to image or to look at mebobian glands uh, and things like that. So any thoughts on that? 
Yes, late, lately I have done run a few dry eye workshops actually, and looked at uh, various patients. And I would say it's it's uh, it's an excellent tool to to use. And um, you know, a picture says a thousand words, yeah. and uh, we can definitely see uh, and grade the the level of the meibomian glands, and it can give you some answers that perhaps you couldn't know otherwise. Because sometimes patients are, you know, complaining they have, um, you know, um, dry eyes and this sort of thing, and we don't know exactly know why. Um, we can express, you know, the myeloma gland to see if it comes out. It is a difficult procedure to do, and I think there's a lot of uh, um, optometrists that are still not that comfortable with, you know, pushing and pressing on those myeloma glands. So being able to do that in a very, um, I would say, non-invasive way is is great. It captures the picture, which we can keep in history. Um, beyond that, uh, it's very quick, actually. So you don't even have to, um, you know, avert the eyelid much, just enough to expose, you know, something yeah. like this. And, you know, a lot of them are, you know, within a second or two and it, it does the analysis for you. So you don't you don't literally have to count the myobomian glands. It will actually do the algorithm to to calculate you know, how much dropout there is. So um, if you do ever get a chance to, to check one out, you can. Hopefully over time these machines will get um, cheaper as well. Yeah. And I was talking to the one of the suppliers here in Singapore that um, one of the local hospitals just purchased 10 10 machines and they're both and they're all worth 30,000 uh Singapore dollars each so you can imagine um you know the eye hospitals are getting into this too so it must be something that is important yeah yeah we we understand that the prevalence of dry eye also is increasing with all this so I think we have to take a step forward uh, and yeah you mentioned very rightly that picture speaks a thousand words so it's a very good tool for patient education like you you don't just talk talk and talk but you show them uh I think that that also plays an important uh, role as well yeah sure yeah for sure it does uh, there's one question which came in, and I think this was regarding the multifocal or the press biope. So somebody would want to know your views on when when you have a new press biope in the chair, how would you kind of uh, talk to them, and do you have any keywords or probably some key uh, phrases which you would say and which you would avoid, you know, when it comes to this press biope? Yeah. Yeah. So. We've had some conversations with some practitioners who are very successful with contact lenses and, and multifocal contacts, and they're very uh, generous to provide their answers. They they realise that denial is a big factor in, in this age group. So um, actually they start to use the words like um, eye fatigue or digital eye strain. Like, Do you feel some you know, digital eye strain, especially at the end of the day? Or And then this opens up the conversation and people are more willing to talk about it. And... Yeah. Um, Again, like I mentioned, starting as early as possible. So at the earliest, for example, you can put um, like a low ad multifocal contact lens in the non-dominant eye to start with, just to help them, you know, ease the fatigue. But with this version, they still get that good binocularity and they, you know, able to do all their functions, but it takes the edge off and makes them feel more comfortable when doing the majority of their visual tasks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the, using these words, I think, can can really help. And you can actually yeah. start even in late 30s to have these discussions with people, you know, before it becomes a stigma, you know, before they right. start struggling. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And I think you did also cover about personalised, uh, you know, treatment options and personalised view. So, you know, talking to them in their own language, what we say is what problems do they have? And once they start throwing up those, and that becomes a conversation starter as well, right? Yeah. It's a conversation starter as well as a goalpost, right? So like my yes. patient who who can't, you know, play tennis anymore. Like if we can get him to do that, you know, that that's what we're working on. And uh, and hopefully when he comes back from holidays, uh, we can get him to do that. <laughs> Great. So I think with that, we have discussed uh, all the questions on the chat. Thank you so much once again, uh, Dr. Shelley, for doing the series for us, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, the holistic vision care and all the sessions are recorded so uh, we do have a session planned over the next weeks we will be sharing more details uh, until then take care be safe and i hope to see you during the next session take care and yeah. bye thanks dr shirley yeah bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.